Welcome to Living Outside the Matrix, the philosophy show where we think outside the box, ask awkward root cause questions, and make it our business to find out the truth so we can thrive. Hi there, I'm your host, Nigel Howitt, and on the show today, we're going to talk about Santa Claus syndrome. Joining me to discuss this is Ethan Indigo Smith, all the way from California in the USA. Um, he is a writer and he's written quite a few books, The Geometry of Energy, uh, The Tai Chi Pill, to name just a couple. And he's also written a book on this subject of the Santa Claus Syndrome. So, Ethan, it's a great pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and a warm welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me, Nigel. I'm greatly appreciative. For the listeners who have no idea what Santa Claus syndrome is, can you can you present it in a nutshell, a couple of uh, sentences? Obviously, we're going to talk around it. We're going to put some flesh sure. on the framework. Can can you give us a sort of a, a broad overview of, of of what we're going to pick apart? The first part of the Santa Claus uh, story and this holiday hazing, as I call it, is um, usually. Uh, pointed to uh, uh, as um, a reasoning to cultivate the magic of childhood innocence, right? It's it's a uh, the the excuse people make to lie to ki- children and and to have this not just a mythological lie, a cultural lie, where the military institutions lie, then the weathermen lie. And everyone you know share takes part in the lie. Um, that first part is to maintain that magical innocence, but in fact, the end result is um, the total killing of a sense of magic, right? Because uh, we are told that actually no, that's silly to imagine that there's someone that nice that would travel around the world and give people presents. Of course, that's not a reality. And and then it's an assumption I'd challenge to, to assume that that's a nice thing to do. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> to make it one's business to travel the planet handing stuff out. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, does it, on any level? <laughs> right. well, and, and it never makes sense to any child for any the child as it start as as one starts to think critically, starts to ask all these definite questions. And there's all these definite lies to the questions, right? And and then the final aspect of the holiday hazing, which is really the magic killer, is, okay, Ethan, now you know the lie. Nigel, now you know the lie. But you can't tell little Chelsea and little Timmy. Now you have to lie, too. And, yeah. and that is the paradigm shaker right that is what leads to i propose adulthood apathy concerning real adult situations 9 11 is the most glaring example of an event that people have not properly questioned and even people are angered when it's questioned right just like when you start questioning santa People or revealing that Santa is fake to children, people get angry. Yeah. People emotionally lose it. Same thing with questioning a lot of real adult um, situations that might contain myths, truths, and lies. Absolutely. I mean, the knock-on effects of institutional. Um, it seems that you know, lying isn't isn't only made or, or the the acceptance of fiction as truth i'd prefer to call it lying i think it's a bit provocative because because parents obviously aren't sort of lying to their children in the in the sense that they're trying to deceive them sure. but, but but they're they're pretending something is true when it is not which is which is arguably perhaps even worse but it isn't just well, it isn't just um that the whole the whole uh, pretense of some fiction is, is completely socialized, isn't it? Because, you know, you've got Auntie Jin, she believes, and the postman, he, he, he told me Father Christmas exists, and then there was that person at the bank. Sinister. Right, and, and it really, it does start off innocent enough, and there's a lot of mythology that's um, presented to us um, that, of course, is not true, but is presented to us as children as truthy, as truthful. Like... 
uh, uh, many, many cultures have this, but it's never done in a process of a, a like a hazing um, as we do with the Santa Claus syndrome. It's never in this process. It's usually um, there's there's no half eaten cookies left behind to as evidence of reality, right? There's there's no um, in the United States the weathermen traditionally lie or or present this myth truth about where Santa is um, as he's delivering Santa, uh, Christmas presents that evening, right? And also in the United States, the biggest military institution of the world uh, has NORAD, which also partakes in the cultural misinformation, saying that they are tracking them, right? So, so <laughs> the, the biggest military institution in the world is talking about Santa, and and that just is a really shaky construct. <laughs> Absolutely, um, but it's interesting. I mean, I, I must um, you know confess to you here and now. I, I, I'm an atheist, so uh, I'm I'm a you know a staunch fan of of reason, if you like, and. <sighs> That's not that's not to say that I don't accept there are a lot of mystery mysterious things that that are that are as yet to me uh, unexplained, but um, I, I am an atheist. So my my concept of spirituality spirituality for me is consciousness. Um, so sure. just just to let you know that that's my my come from. So so I so the, the stories of the religions I, I I see them for what they are. I was raised a Catholic, um, and so I, and I was very much raised within this Father Christmas story. But to to me, I see the 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 mythical figure of Santa Claus. This is sort of paternal caring figure that's somehow watching you and knows how you behave and he's going to come and reward you if you're accommodating should we say if you're compliant mm -hmm. to, you, to your handlers or your guardians or, or parents so so yeah. so this this idea of this 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 being seems very analogous to believing in god because absolutely i i i that's a that's a great parallel and i, I think it it really is for children, the the parallels are obvious. When we get to be adults, we say, "Oh, that's s silly," right? Mm. Um, and and actually, uh, I like to look at Santa, of course, as God, like you said, in in that uh, benevolent, paternal watcher, um, and and all knowing. Um, and I see you can even extrapolate one. One could say that. Uh, Rudolph is like Jesus, right? Because Rudolph is the reject that becomes the leader, right? Okay. And and he leads the other reindeer with his light, right? But but the 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 real neat thing I, I find about Rudolph, and I think for most kids, it. Santa, yeah, of course they love Santa. They're kind of afraid of Santa, like a uh, godliness figure, right? Every kid loves Rudolph. Every kid really embodies this uh, connection with Rudolph because Rudolph is told, you know what? Hey, kid, your nose is too bright. You're not old enough. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You can't be in our reindeer games. That's what kids hear all the time. You, you're not old enough. You're not big enough. You can't do this. And then for Rudolph to become the leader, Rudolph is a, a real personification of this childhood experience where we're the reject, right? And where we can wait. Okay, yeah, I can be the leader with my light. If people just knew that my big nose was cool right and then again the process of the revelation of the lie totally uh, uh, dis disfigures that potential for kids right they go wait so there is no Rudolph either there's no reject that becomes the architect that becomes the leader and no no that doesn't happen right I mean you mm -hmm. see right so 
it's it's really this magic killer and innocence killer in, in in the process of it, even though people claim the the otherwise. Where, where did Father Christmas start? I mean, um, I've I've heard that it was Saint Nicholas, you know, allegedly some uh, uh, Christian figure who was benevolently handing out children, uh, you know, poor children, some toys, um, uh, you know, that sort of time of year. Can you elaborate on 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 how this sort of where, where did you know, where did Father Christmas begin? It's an interesting story and relates to a lot of uh, religious relationships have all these multicultural influences and relations, and it's because we're all human, right? Um, but but Saint Nicholas not only is uh, he uh, a, a saint of uh, giving to gifts to children, he was also a saint for sailors. For who? Right? For, so sorry, he, for sailors? For sailors, okay. yes. And so his caricature, excuse my lisp, traveled farther and wider than most other saints, being that he was with the sailors, right? So um, he, in, his, uh, in this story's travels, it also picked up a lot of different elements from different parts of the world. Right. And so there is this saint from Turkey that was St. Nicholas that did these things. But he was the patron saint of sailors. Right. And so this this really uh, brought the story farther and wider than other saintly figures. But but there were elements where uh, or there are elements rather of Santa that you can trace back to shamans of siberia right where the the shamans of siberia would visit the villagers and the snow was so deep he would climb down the smoke hole and he would bring them gifts right and and some herbs and some you know people often say that he would bring them mushrooms but but he he the the shamans were uh, often dressed in these red and white things and they had reindeer and they had bells and and they jumped down the smoke hole to say hello to the families so there's 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 a bunch of different elements um and and uh the main reason that most of the world looks at santa in his current dress um is because of coca-cola coca-cola wanted to adopt this actually looking at the fundamentals of consciousness influence and advertising right they totally hijacked this godly figure that sees you and knows everything and they said hey have a coke and a smile um and and so the the main reason that uh christmas became um this out of control uh celebration of buying stuff is really due to sand uh, excuse me to coca-cola and then other uh, the new york city um, macy's and bloomingdale's adopted him as an advertising campaign too right sure. uh, for for a while in the united states santa story was outlawed right because of uh, whatever uh, pr- you know, Protestant constrained religiosity was here at the time. They didn't like uh, Santa taking away from Jesus. This is the celebration of Jesus, right? Um, and so it's it's. I like to say too, in reflect of obtaining things, when we're we're always thinking and and asking. We I mean, we tell children, hey, it's better to give than to receive. But we never ask them, what are you going to give your parents? We always ask them, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want? And so when our consciousness is in a place of obtaining and what do I want, we're never thinking about really higher concepts like what is really going on, right? Sure. So, I, I mean, so, I, I think there are there are many um, aspects of the Father Christmas story that that serve to scupper 
the development of human consciousness and and uh, I, one of them is definitely the conditioning into uh, accepting free gifts for nothing because as we all know life isn't like that things don't land in our laps we we generally have to work for values and and this idea of of expecting the unearned the other perhaps more significant issue is that when a young child or young consciousness is uh, is trying to integrate because our mind is an integrating unit or at least it should be if it's functioning properly we identify different aspects of reality we gather knowledge and we integrate it we we deliberately join the dots and we build a sum of non-contradictory knowledge you know this is this is really how, how the humans learn and and, and grow um, and at, at that developing stage where we're sold a line of, of some story that's just so so outlandish it can't possibly be true on, on so many levels that let's not even list them it's it's such obvious nonsense when the child really sits down and thinks about it you know how's he going to fit down our chimney daddy and how's he going to deliver presents to everyone in the world all in one night and you know just just you could go on and on and on but because because the whole story the whole lie is fundamentally non-integratable into our consciousness. It, it, it has to be sort of kept separate. And this, this is like a, a I, I consider anyway, it's like a spanner in the workings of the mind, uh, which disrupts the process of integration. Integration, we should, we should be making all these things join together in our minds. That's how we make sense of reality, you know, check for consistency. And I think I see the Santa Claus syndrome as, as really scuppering um, the the capacity and the inclination, indeed, to in integrate our knowledge into into one meaningful, non contradictory whole. So, I mean, as you can see, I'm I'm coming at this from from an atheist. I don't believe in another reality other than this one. Um, so, so, yeah, some well, pro well, profound. I don't need to take away from that. I I actually I when I say spirituality. And meditation, I think of really practical concepts too. I I, I try not to necessarily uh, get into religiosity, and and actually too, I think um, for one, what you're saying in the beginning, how it's kind of this, uh, it verifies fiction, right? It it almost um, gets people to point to fiction as being valuable. And as you were just noting, it points to or even indoctrinates doublethink in the very purest form, right? Where we we completely obfuscate everything else we've learned to allow for this one accepted pile of assumedly BS that the collective says, no, 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 yeah, this is this is it, and and then. Surely that, uh, as as I was proposing in my writing, it really uh, sanctifies the conformity of monotheism, not just religion, but monotheism, which which I think it's a misnomer for people to say that monotheism is the worship of one God. It's in fact the insistence of one way to perceive God. And, and that's why there are multiple, m m many forms of multi multiple monotheisms besides the main three. And so it really leads to monothematic thinking, right? Where we, ac we accept the indoctrination and the lies, not necessarily pertaining to Santa, pertaining to really um, serious adult situations and every war is preceded by lies and people have to accept the lies to proceed with the war and that whole process of being um accepting the the collective misinformation of santa is this cultural apathy that we see now i think yep cultural apathy i mean I, i'd also sort of tag the word disillusionment in there too because uh, when when the young um the young person the young boy or, or, or adolescent um uh, girl obviously when they discover that the parents have lied to them um when they discover that everyone's prepared to lie you know even the postman and the local shopkeeper 
um, this, this must sow the seeds of some fundamental disillusionment in, in, in humanity. I mean, although, although people might not be able to make it explicit, so they might not be conscious that that's, that's their conclusion. I mean, how, how could you avoid the conclusion? You've got to be quite a strong person to avoid forming that conclusion that, that the world's just, in, well, lying is institutionalized, isn't it? It's socialized. Everyone does it. And it's okay. And, and don't we see that played out in very real, serious adult situations when you mention the corruption and lying that goes on with our institutions today, government, corporate, and otherwise? People go, well, yeah, that's what they, that, of course they're lying. It just plays out to where we, we accept the, the adult lies because we're, we're so, you know, patterned. Absolutely. That, right? I mean, we, we, we obviously have uh, the Easter Bunny and unicorns and we have the Tooth Fairy and, and, and all of these other miscellaneous untruths. It isn't just uh, yeah. Santa Claus, but, but obviously Santa Claus syndrome sort of covers the, the whole thing. So to sort of zoom out a minute and, and clock the context of where we're at today, you know, um, I, I speak of the matrix, the mainstream, the sort of great a cultural download that we're all uh, subject to and and it's my view that in the absence of thinking for ourselves in the in the absence of of of, of asking root cause questions of questioning things not accepting a story just because most people believe it or because figures in authority believe it but but uh, you know seeking to independently find out um, truth that this is this is a, um, a, a very very important part of our human development um, becoming psychologically independent if you will and today most people tend to not think not question things um, and and accept whatever you know is it a lie is it truth who cares almost I mean most people are, are that <laughs> apathetic and is that traceable back to Santa Claus syndrome well so I know for me and and really every kid that I've interacted with in adulthood there was a year at least in my childhood where after Christmas, my mom had to say, okay, forget about Santa. Like, it's going to be another year. Like, it's February now. It's going to be a while. Like, you know, forget it. Yeah. And so um, I think certainly there are other influences, but it's uh, uh, before we can even talk, we're celebrating Santa. And, and the most valuable holiday to every kid is, is Christmas. And it's during the time period when we're most easily influenced, right? When that, that idea, if you hear something often enough, you'll believe it. And also, what you hear first, you'll probably believe that too, right? And so... Even though, of course, we heard Santa is real first, we, we, we learn that's not true. But there's elements of that uh, training and that suggestion that I think really do play out in adulthood. Not to say, though, that the education system is kind of um, belittling our self-development and our pursuits of consciousness, too. Right. It that the 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 state education system is designed for factory workers. That's a fact. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. Sure. We need to change the education system, of course, to empower people. Um, so so certainly um, it's and I see it, education and and really the news, too, as more indoctrination. Oh, completely, then, then, and it's then, easy. It's then, easy to to feed in uh, endless indoctrination, isn't it? Once once you've laid the the framework, if you like, for the acceptance of untruth, as we've already as we've already mentioned. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's fascinating. I, I think that it also ties in with another key fundamental myth that I put forward, and uh, you know, we, we we may we may have different views on that. That's okay. I'm not uh, out to persuade anyone, but I, I'm convinced that the mainstream traditional ethics, the traditional morality, the traditional standard of good as being um, as being giving, 
because this is a very uh, strong component of Christmas being a time for giving. You, you've mentioned, of course, the contradiction in that children all just want what they can get. But, but we're very much hammered home with this, with this uh, um, reinforcement, if you like, that, that it's good to give, it's good to give up. And, and to me, the important issue is that it, it trivialises, it undermines the value of true giving. It undermines, because uh, giving, if, if, it's, if it's really authentic, it, it's more spontaneous. As soon as something becomes a duty, you know, we, we, we all are familiar with that, that pressure to give certain Christmas presents to you know whatever it is nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters and 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 what have you there's this colossal exchange of, of gifts nobody gets to choose what they want everyone just gets some stuff and to me that seems to trivialize the the you know genuine acquisition of values when we acquire the things that right. we really really want um, so there's there's a number of a number of things, I think, again, distorting our psychology right down to a you know, fundamental level. That reminds me, Nigel, in, in World War I, on the front lines, there were a couple of Christmases where the French and Germans had Christmas dinner together. And so if we can give a gift on one day, or if we can have peace on one day, well, let's expand on that and let's really do it. Because just being giving on one day, mm, like you like you were suggesting, is that is that really being concerned with my fellow man? And is that really being generous? And just being peaceful with my fellow man on one day, is that really doing it? No. no. It's putting it into a tiny box, isn't it? I mean, one day of the year. <laughs> right, and and it really promotes the acceptance of, well, uh, at least this year I'll be nice. Or, excuse me, this day I'll be nice. But then the rest of the year we go about being really what the world is coming down to is being greedy crabs in a barrel. Like, everyone is uh, uh, being giving only with their really finite circle, right? And so if we just maybe just be a little less out to obtain, then we're actually being more giving, right? Um, but the, it's, it's this shallowness of bringing it all into one day, uh, uh, you know, really. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very sad to take, uh, you know, if, if it is all about goodwill or the season of goodwill, um, if, if it is all, you know, why, as you say, why isn't all year a season of goodwill? It's, it's just more nonsense on top of nonsense, isn't it? So, so I guess your whole thesis is that um, Santa Claus syndrome or, or this, this uh, story of the benevolent father figure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, holding such a dominant place during such forming, forming uh, sorry, such um, such crucial years in the in the formation of our of our consciousness and our, and our sense of identity must have um, I mean shockingly um, long, yeah, exactly. long range long range uh, yeah. effects right across the decades of our lives. Absolutely, and and I point to the specifics of that, and I also make suggestions as to the effects of other cultural traditions um, in pertaining to re religiosity, right? Because um, these, these are formalities and constructs that really um, put our thinking into a box, you know, a, a, as, as in the matrix, right? That's when I think of the matrix, I think of a, a box within a box within a box where there's no exit, right? And, and so understanding our consciousness um, is the prescription for developing it. Absolutely. And, and, and questioning the influences of our own thinking and being is the prescription, right? If you have the Santa Claus syndrome, question if you do, and that's the prescription for it. it, it it's, you know, um, a lot of other the, this leads to the medical institutions trying to control people 
the uh, insistence that something is wrong with them and they need drugs, right? The whole psychiatric kick interest institution is really aligned with this indoctrination and education system to really keep people down, right? And, you know, again, that's not necessarily my opinion. It is an opinion, but it's formed out of uh, fact, right? Um, so... Yep. So, so, what would you say then, Ethan? Are the um, the main visible signs or symptoms of Santa Claus syndrome uh, within an adult, we, within the average person? We, we've touched upon um, for point one. We've touched upon the acceptance that lying's okay and 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 disillusionment, if you like. Um, is anybody concerned about the truth? Um, what What are the other key factors? Do you think that we should look for perhaps as we well, introspect often, introspect and ask ourselves whether we have Santa Claus syndrome I think it was Carl Jung I, I might be mistaken on who this quote is from but if you want to know who's in control find out who you cannot question and um, when if you bring up the Santa Claus story uh, amongst family children present or not that's inconsequential you will see highly emotive reactions this is certainly an indicator of santa claus syndrome when people get upset at the discussion of it um but it i think it, it comes it comes with uh, the insistence of that lying to children is okay it is a, a, a certain remark um and and the really the uh, emotive response to even questioning if this celebration that is focused on kids it's not uh, santa is totally focused on kids yeah. and though adults celebrate it it's it's a it's a, a process for them you know whether whether we want to uh, like it or not that's what we're doing and so um bringing up the subject and when people react then you you, you can see uh, their likelihood of having Santa Claus syndrome. And I like to say Christmas comes once a year. Santa Claus syndrome lasts all year long. People have distorted thinking, right? And when you accept that, then you can expand and refine it, right? But, but um, if people refuse that the Santa Claus story influenced them, they're, they're probably more influenced by it than they realized i think it was lao tzu who said signs and symbols control the world not rules and laws well what did he mean santa claus story right that's a sign and symbol that rules the world because of its influence on our consciousness sure i mean i i, I accept that signs and symbols can have a very powerful effect but again, one of the themes of, of, of this show and my work is that through the act of deliberate conscious examination, if we, if we sift through our usually held subconsciously, of course, collection of conclusions and assumptions and beliefs and convictions about the nature of reality, about everything that we've ever learned and come across, if we, if we apply our own thinking process um, and you, you've already indicated that uh, thinking process is, is scuppered and to some extent damaged by this Santa Claus syndrome. But if we can do this process of, uh, of picking through our subconscious, we can heal ourselves effectively. We can rejoin the dots and go, oh, OK, well, I was told that that wasn't true. But in actual fact, now I know blah, 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 blah. So, so, so I'm optimistic that, that, that healing is possible effectively and we can you know, eventually come to a place where we can join the dots in our mind and overcome perhaps any disillusionment that might be programmed down there in our subconscious. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I agree completely. The, the potential of our consciousness is really, uh, we, 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 I wouldn't say it's limitless, but we don't know the limits of it, right? We certainly know how basic we can get. Right. And um, if, if we see our experience 
and our brains processing these experiences, we can see that when we remove patterns and renew our understanding about concepts, our consciousness expands. I mean, I it's it's not a uh, I don't like the new age movement. It's it's not a new age concept to say that. I had a low age, uh, excuse me, a low vibration recently, and now I feel better. I'm operating a little higher vibration, right? It's it's something that we can institute and and practice because we've refined our thinking. And like, um, there's an expression: if you're hurt but you have a high consciousness, you're you're fine. If you're not hurt and have a low consciousness, you're not. It's it's bad. Bad news. Bad news. Right. What, what, um, what do you mean if you? What do you mean if you're not hurt and you have a low consciousness? Well, well, I mean to say, a lot of people find uh, that physical disease and difficulty is um, among the most difficult things to deal with, right? And so, and that's actually why it's called dis-ease, right? It's not easy. Um, but if you ever or uh, can imagine the cliche of the happy guy in the wheelchair that's that's the high consciousness with a with a with a physical problem right and if you can imagine the the young person that has everything ahead of them (laughs) and uh all their body working and 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 they're upset that's a lower consciousness with uh uh, their physical in perfect form right so that's tough that's a tough place to be even when it's just a, a juvenile thing like that, but but there's different, uh, you know, you know, levels of that. So, so would you um, conclude then that Santa Claus syndrome does, uh, at the very least, compromise uh, our capacity to think, and and therefore, I think, it's, I think it's inarguable, really, that that it is for one influential, and. Most people I talk to, when I mention Santa Claus syndrome, they might have an idea that I'm talking about how it influences people to be greedy and want things, right? And that's not it. But certainly, I think people understand that that has that potential. But I think the whole practice culminates in this apathy to lies and and, you know, when you're talking about fiction versus reality, it made me think about morality and legality, right? People are so institutionalized that they'll accept legality as morality when, in fact, it's not aligned necessarily, right? And so I think it, it leads to greed potentially and it leads to apathy potentially and it leads to standing in a row and being in line of conformity potentially um but it certainly has an influence whatever the influence might be and often enough people will say yeah but in my house we did this and i don't mean to diminish people's personal experience I'm more talking about the collective, right? People's personal experience may have been totally in line with the hollow, if you will, construct of the Santa Claus celebration, but not have conceived hollowness, Mm. right? But but the collective aspect is what I'm talking about. And I never want to criticize uh, personal or individual i'm i'm really looking at the entire collective the sure. effect on our culture it's it's interesting uh, this uh, the idea of greed because um I, I may have a slightly different take on greed in in my view greed only really pertains to the unearned it's like uh, you know you go to a, a hotel and it's all you can eat you're at the all you can eat buffet <laughs> OK, if, 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 if you've got a wallet full of money and, you know, you think, well, OK, I'm hungry, I'm just going to get this, that and the other. If you're paying for stuff, you just 
you just operate differently at that buffet table when it's when it's when it's free or when it's you know the all you can eat scenario if it may be an all inclusive package for example on, on holiday just for example but we know that we always we always go for what we don't need when it's the unearned and i think there's a there's a tie in because because i think it's a very important thing to realize this this uh, striving to seek the unearned i think this is quite a key part of christmas it's, and and that's a great I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Nigel. That's a, uh, that's a great con uh, concept, and I I can't argue that at all. Mm. Uh, I I would I would agree with that a hundred percent. I would just say that looking at the oligarchs of the world, they um, when you get to the point when you have amassed say fifty million dollars, a billion, someone was taken from someone um experienced their greed in obtaining that whether they quote because no one can work for that amount of money i i don't see how i could honestly work for 50 million dollars i could definitely connive plot and scheme and make it work for me i could do that well but let, let me play devil's advocate to that if if you please, were to create something of immense value to everyone on the planet true. Um, you know that that would that would be if if we think of uh, of trading as exchanging value for value. If if somebody like Jeff Bezos, um, love him or loathe him, um, he's done a great job because everyone uses Amazon to buy stuff, and I think Amazon's great. I mean, part of right. me, part of my old conditioned self, uh, hates the fact that you know one day we we'll, might refer to it, it'll all be the corporation. Um, but the truth is that that he. You know, this, this chap Bezos has created something that benefits me and almost everybody I know. And as a result, he's the richest man in the world. So, so is it true that you couldn't earn 50 billion or, or whatever? Because if you can come up with, no, if you, you're right. You're right. If you can come up with an idea that's so good and so useful to everyone, then hell, people are going to be falling over themselves to give you something for what they've got from you effectively because i mean i don't i don't shop from amazon to be nice to jeff bezos i do it right. because it suits me and uh, and it's it's really really convenient so yeah so so th there's something would, there with I would the say idea you're absolutely right and and that i will have to refine my presentation <laughs> of that in saying that most often people that earn that much have done something to that's yeah. greedy Obviously, if you become a billionaire, which which you know I, I can only use my imagination to to, sure. to 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 see that my whole scale of values is going to change, isn't it? You know, sure. spending spending fifty dollars on a new pair of shoes when you're a billionaire is just like you know just throw it away. You know, I don't care whether they're fifty dollars or a hundred dollars; it doesn't matter because because the just the scale of of of, of your values is, is so changed. And and maybe this this causes people to um, you know if to, to to think that greed is such a bad thing. I, mean, I I personally just question whether greed is such a bad thing. And to me, it's key that it's tied with wanting to gain the unearned because everyone wants more and more of the unearned quick before the offer closes, but before it's unavailable, <laughs> grab it while you can. You know, and whereas when we, yeah, when we when we go to the market with our with our um, with our wallet, with whatever we've earned, with the value that we've gained and represented by our money, I don't think people are greedy. People choose what yeah. they want. Okay. Every every purchase is a decision. Well, I, I want to get that first, and yeah, then I want to get that. But then if I get those two, I can't get this. You know, usually for most of us on on some kind of budget. You've mentioned in your work that there are four stages of Santa Claus syndrome. Can you can you run us through that one, uh, Ethan? Sure. Well, uh, the first stage is accepting the lie, right? Um, and uh, the second stage is communicating it. And uh, the third stage is insisting it. Um, and the fourth stage is playing out these problematic results in really revealing that expression signs and symbols rule the world right these these uh cultural stories that 
let's face it, the Western world doesn't have many unifying, cohesive cultural stories besides Santa. And and you brought up uh, the Easter Bunny and the other silly holiday characters. None so celebrated, remarked, and um, like, do you know the story of the Easter Bunny? I, I don't know. No. <laughs> right? <laughs> Like, like everyone knows the story of the Easter Bunny when a, or excuse me, Santa, when a five-year-old comes up to them and says, do you know if Santa's real? Because I just wanted to ask you, oh yeah, yeah, he goes down the chimneys. Yeah, well, some people don't have chimneys and he just, I think he snaps his fingers and it just happens. But what? You, you're saying that too? And so everyone knows this cohesive story that, yeah, it is an innocent lie. But the results are that we tolerate really big lies, right? And how upsetting is it to tell someone's kid that Santa isn't real? Because every kid that learns that Santa isn't real is going to taste that. Every kid. I did it. Every kid is going to go and say, oh, well, I won't tell Timmy or Chelsea, but I'm going to tell Bobby. When you're not looking, I'm going to go tell him that Santa is real. What? Ah! Everyone gets upset when they are revealed that they've been lied to. And so people don't want that. People don't want to be upset. So they just go into drone mode and get in a row and say, it's okay. Don't tell me that's a lie. I don't want to hear that. (laughs) <laughs> it's deeply sinister, isn't it? It's it's interesting because because um, we home educate uh, our children here. My wife and I we've got three young children, and um, they are ten, eight, and six at the moment. And we've always uh, told them that Father Christmas, as we refer to this figure here in in England is uh, a story we've always said it's a story and uh, and they said is it what you mean it's not true daddy and we say well of course it's not true but it's a great story so let's just go along with the story and 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 what we've what we've found is is that our children have displayed obvious pleasure in that they know that it's just a story so so they've kind of but they they feel i don't know how best to explain it slightly you know one one step ahead of the others if you like one step ahead of all the other kids that haven't figured that out yet it's the first time that a a person experiences a grade up and it and it and it goes with it goes with that remark usually not with your kids because they were told it in the right manner but it usually goes with now that you know the truth you have to lie too right so that's that that's that sinister element yeah well my children uh (laughs) seem to have uh bucked the trend there because they 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 like their approach to sort of telling other children, you know, in their childlike way it is, is what you don't, you don't believe in that rubbish. Do you? Don't you know that it's, it's just a story and, and they, right. um, it's kind of uh, as though they intuitively realize that they're one step ahead of someone because they're actually in touch with reality. They're actually in touch with are. a piece of truth. They are. Yeah. And, and I think knowing the, magic of the story that leads to the potentiation of magic in life not this build-up of magical constructs and then pulling out the carpet from underneath their feet you are teaching your kids about consciousness and and the magic of stories that's that's real magic right there right absolutely I, uh, th- there's one argument isn't there that Oh, it's it's nice. It's all for the children, and it helps their imagination and all this sort of thing. I, I'm not sure that that uh, that's true. I, I think that you could, as you just say, um, it, when you when you consciously and deliberately say this is a story, let's dive into this story. Yeah, I think that's when right. the imagination really can, uh, you know, unfold its wings, if you like, because the 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 person the child the 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 consciousness that's involved isn't grappling with what's real and what's not there's no confusion it's like okay that's reality here's the story i know where i am right let's dive into the story let's get imaginative and 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 i think that unleashes the imagination more than 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 some uh, you know fake when when 
and and we can see that in every other tale when the if it's an obvious allegory you ask the child after the story is over what did that story mean well he's trying to teach not to do that not to do this and 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 maybe he gets other maybe the child gets other layers later but we all learn by allegory that's a, that's a, and dialogue that's the best way to learn and so a, a child intuitively knows how to learn by allegory. It, and, can, and can you can you explain so, and expand on learning by allegory, just in case um, any listeners don't understand? Well, that. you know, I I I'm I love to, and one of my favorite allegories is one of the most famous, and that's the allegory of the cave, and and this of course is insidious in all of culture. Uh, in the Bible, it, it predates the Bible. In the Garden of Eve, Eden, it has uh, um, elements of that, and up to um, including 1984 and in the Matrix. Um, this allegory is one where the prisoners are conceived to be in a cave and kept. Um, uh, being shown essentially what is propaganda by the the captors who are displaying light on the cave. And then a, a prisoner is freed and brought out of the cave. And after his eyes adjust, he realizes what is real and what is a shadow. And eventually he realizes that he has to return to the cave and tell everyone that they're being lied to, that what they think is reality is not reality, and they have to get out of their chains and stop watching the shadows on the wall being displayed by their captors. And everyone makes fun of him <laughs> for, for having this story, and, and his eyes haven't adjusted back to the cave, and he can't see the shadows as well. So... Um, that's one of my favorite allegories, and and this is um, not only socio-political allegory, but it's a consciousness allegory, right? It's it's how many caverns of consciousness can we escape from, right? How many layers can we um, bring into light, right? And and with with the collective, it's a matter of what is the point of any religion or any spirituality if you're not going back into the cave and helping people what is your point well well there's an example too of what i think is greedy right if people have a whole bunch of stuff and the consciousness that the freed prisoner has and they're not going back into the cave to help someone out that at this point in time we can potentially say that that's greedy. I mean, when when clean water is scarce, when clean air is practically gone, and people are letting others exist, washing shadows on the wall. Well, we should all, you know, whether and you know whether it's morality or spirituality or I jest and I say God forbid religiosity. We should all help each other right do you know what though my take on going back into the cave if you like could could be likened to what some people might call going around trying to wake people up but in my experience and and from some of the things that you've just said people don't really want to be woken up people you know even no. even the story of the allegory of the cave you know plato's um uh, cave right. people don't want to be woken up so i mean personally i don't feel any inclination to go and wake someone up i mean i love having conversations with people and if anyone's interested in anything you know great i'll i'll engage but the idea of uh trying to trying to press that button that will fire someone's starter motor to to kick start their curiosity and their their, their acquisition of knowledge is is utterly is a completely futile endeavor in, in my I was view to say 
I think I agree with you. And but I think what we're doing is is the right way to do it. it the right way to hopefully someone gets this conversation and and has some enlightenment enlightening questions or or concepts come about. But but going into the cave with a flashlight, hey, wake up. No one likes that. Right? What did they end up doing to the freed prisoner? They killed him. They killed him. Okay. Right? Because he went in there and he had his bright light. Hey, you no one wants that. Yeah. No one. No one wants that. And they will kill you. <laughs> That's well, the end of that story. I, I like I like the allegory story um for for its uh, illustration, if you like, that there is a way out, that there is a knowable reality. And although although uh, you know the story might portray or the concept of the of an allegory might might um show us that it's easy to to live thinking that shadows are real it's easy to live with a false philosophy with a bunch of presumptions and premises right down your subconsciouses but they can all be false you can be barking right up the wrong right. tree but it, it, it it's kind of hopeful for me because because it, it shows me that there is a, a and 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 there demonstrably is you know a firm reality that we can all come out of the cave and discover and you know hopefully more and more people will be coming out <laughs> to, to join the conversation <laughs> well well you nailed it right there nigel and i think uh we even though you and i are not necessarily religious we have um grown up in a society of monotheism and that has really produced a whole bunch of monothematic thinking, right? And people generally, they won't admit they're wrong. They don't like to admit that their four years of college education was actually um, not correct, right? Or extrapolate on that a bunch. But the expression, I think it was Socrates, it might have been Plato, but all logic is flawed, if we just accept that and then look at our own self, we can develop our logic, right? And and certainly all logic is flawed because we are limited in our potential to sense things, right? And when we start to say that, well, I read this one book and I, now I know everything, then that's a big flaw, right? But when we admit that, yeah, I think I know a couple of things in a couple of different systems, and I've refined this and that, still my logic is flawed. And then it's higher, right? Uh, uh, there's a Zen cone. Great doubt, great awakening. Little doubt, little awakening. No doubt, no awakening. <laughs> I, I can I can get get where that one's pointing. I mean, I I, I must admit I don't agree that lo logic is flawed. I mean, I, my computer works on logic, and uh, and and it, and when the, when it working logically, it works. Um, and when the, you know there's a virus in it, or, or but that's or, not a human. That's not a human. But the but our mental processes, our faculty of reason. Um, uses the method of logic. We, we know, for example, sure. we know, for example, that in reality contradictions don't exist. You know, I can't go that way and that way at the same time. I can't be hot and cold at the same time. Th something can't exist and not exist at the same time. So, so we 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 all implicitly get um, that that you can't that contradictions don't exist. And when we spot them, when we when we come up with something that conflicts with another idea. That is our red flag that says, ah, error. Because if there's a contradiction, we know that they don't exist in reality. So if they, are think, if they exist in our ideas or are in our understanding, then there must be an error. So, so, so my understanding is that logic is our friend. I mean, we, 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 oh, all, have, we all have a limited knowledge, of course, and there's, there's plenty we don't know. There, there, are, there are, you know, all sorts of mysterious things that, that, that are as, as yet unexplained. Um, but I think maybe maybe it's best applied when an institution presents um, a proposition of certainty. When they say we've gone through this and it's completely unflawed, then one must say, well, potentially logic is flawed. Or, or <laughs> right? they could be lying. You see, they, they could just be wrong. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And, uh, and so, people so, yeah. like to uh, assume that 
what they've uh, researched via statistics and so on and so forth is correct. Yeah. Well, actually, let's just lend a little bit of doubt to it for a second. Let's. Sure. And I wish we did this with 9/11. Right. With 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 the biggest crime and attack on the United States history. No one questioned it. How do we move forward? Do you think? Where, where do we? Well, I like to teach children real magic, which which and I don't mean to bring into this uh, uh, any BS uh, new age stuff, but real magic in the sense that I can shift myself right when i have the knowledge of myself rather than being uh uh constrained and controlled in a row like the reindeer and just going along with the status quo then then i can you know proceed to understand a little bit better and not be as conformed to the story. Great, so Ethan. I'm uh, I'm aware that we're um, might have bust some time limits here, but uh, um, well, where can I'm, where I'm can really appreciate Thank um, you so much. Nice. No worries. Where where can people contact you, Ethan? Um, I mentioned a couple of your books. You, you've uh, you've been busy writing, um, as I've uh, hinted at briefly earlier on. The the book um, titled A Holiday Hazing. Santa Claus syndrome is one, and I'll put a link to that um, in in the show notes and down below here on YouTube. Um, wh where can people contact you or find out a bit more about what you're up to? I'm I'm on all the usual social media promoting myself and my writing, and um, I do have a book also titled "The Matrix of Four: The Philosophy of the Duality of Polarity," which ended up being a recital of the righteous rebel the the archetype of the righteous rebel so i think you and your folks would, would appreciate that too i might um, have to pick up a copy it sounds interesting yeah, I'll, well, I'll, I'll send you i'll get you i'll get you some info on that, that, um, that and i'm on of course jeff bezos wing i'm under his uh <laughs> <laughs> his company Good. so all my titles are available on on there and so forth Fantastic. and i always appreciate questions and a communication so if anyone wants to reach out to me please don't hesitate fantastic great stuff well ethan thank you so much for for taking the time uh, to to join us today really really appreciate that and expanding on this concept santa claus syndrome how this experience of this mythical figure goes on to affect us uh, in ways we, we we are unconscious of and don't know about you know on through the decades all through our lives fascinating um topic indeed so um i'd urge you guys anybody out there who's interested to maybe check out some of ethan's other work also please visit uh, my website lawfulrebel.com there's loads more uh, provocative stories there where we uncover all sorts of um myths in the uh, modern mainstream culture so thank you so much for listening, and I do hope you'll join me again for another episode of Living Outside the Matrix.